In this episode, we speak to the man who is behind one of Canada's largest mental health charities, Jack the Dork. I've personally worked with Jack the Dork for the last couple of years. I'm extremely passionate about the work they do and what they're advocating for. I have traveled all across Canada and donated thousands of my own dollars in support of their initiatives because they're using a youth empowerment model that trains and supports over 3,000 youth leaders across every single province and territory in this country to deliver programming to support youth who are struggling with mental health, show them how to remove the stigma in their communities, and how to be there for each other. So I couldn't be more proud to bring this episode forward. We are speaking with the one and only Eric Windler. This is Gript. Eric, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Jonathan. I couldn't think of anyone better that I'd like to interview. And the reason why is because Gript is about mental health, but it's about primarily the ideas and the initiatives and the projects that change makers are using to shape the world. And those ideas are are the vehicle, from what I've found, um, where people are really engaged with life They're really gripped on an idea. Those people tend to have, in my opinion, what I've seen, a really strong mental health. And so if it wasn't for me being very gripped with the idea of advocating for youth mental health, and if it wasn't for you being very gripped with the idea of advocating for youth mental health, we never would have met. That's for sure. I'm happy we did. Uh, And I remember the Silver Dinner Gala back in 2017, where I heard I was speaking for Health and Minds Canada, and I heard your story for the very first time. And I do recall that it brought me to tears. And so I just wanted to say, as we jump in here, that I'm really grateful for all the work that your family does, for all the work your team does, because you've, you've had a lot of confidence in me and you've opened me up to a ton of opportunity and experience. And I don't think I'd have as much joy or adventure in my life if it wasn't for you folks. So thanks for that. Well, thank you. And I admire all your contributions uh, to life generally, but to our work at Jack.org, you've been a huge contributor. So thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate that. Gripped, if you know, if thinking about it, couldn't think of a better word for how the whole topic of mental health uh, impacted me. I have become gripped with this whole thing, that is for sure. Yeah, and that's exactly where I'd love to start off. You lead a team that's revolutionizing the way that we think and we feel and we talk about mental health. And for those that are listening that don't know you and they don't know what jack.org is or what you folks are up to. Can you tell us a little bit about how it started and then how it's progressed to what it is today? Uh, sure. Uh, and as you well know, Jonathan, uh, the story has a, a sad starting. Uh, we were, uh, myself and my wife, Sandra Hannington, and our, our three kids, Jack, Ben, and Julia, uh, back in 2010. I, literally, we thought we were the happiest, healthiest, and in many ways, the most fortunate family you could imagine. You know, we were happy with our careers. The kids were doing well at school. And, uh, and then one day, uh, I came home from a spinning class with Sandra and my cell phone, 2010, uh, my cell phone rang and uh, it was a police officer. And uh, he said he had to come to the house. Uh, and in three minutes, he was at the house. And within 30 seconds after that, uh, this, this police officer and, you know, just, uh, feel so sorry for these guys who have to do this, these first responders, he had the task of telling us that we had lost Jack, uh, and that he had died, uh, uh, the previous night in his dorm room at Queens university. He was a first year student at Queens. So, um, much different than the way we work now. That was my, um, you know, welcome to the whole topic of mental health and suicide. We, we had no idea this was coming, no warning whatsoever, and uh, it gripped me and our family as we, uh, uh, you know, obviously were devastated by what had happened. And uh, uh, for some reason, um, uh, I just felt almost immediately, but certainly from uh, a week or two or three after, as you the, the fog starts to clear a little bit and you get through those things you have to do, when tragedy hits, and uh, and uh, I just 
needed to do something. And, uh, uh, you know, Sandra and, and Ben and Julia and our closest friends uh, were totally behind you know, me just stepping away from what I always have done and uh, figuring out how we could get involved. Because bottom line is, Jonathan, if I honestly felt, and I still feel to this day, if this could happen to to us, it can happen to anybody. And, you know, there's something very unnatural about uh, losing a uh, son or a daughter. And uh, um, I just couldn't put up with that. So that was how it all started. And I'd be happy to tell you more. Uh, but it's it's a bit of a story, <laughs> so you tell me how much you want to how much you want to go into. Yeah, I, I want to acknowledge that it's extremely challenging to have conversations like this, and that's why I really appreciate you coming on the show to discuss. Like you said, if this could happen to you, it could happen to anyone, and it is happening to a lot of people. And one thing that I I wanted to try to understand around this story with Jack is because it's so challenging to tell, how do you inspire other people or how do you think about sharing with other people when they need to have conversations like this? How do they find the strength to be able to do this? Because over the last 10 years, you've had to tell that story a lot. Yeah, it, the story has become um, much easier to tell, uh, partly because I've told it a lot, but, but also because uh, there has been quite a shift in society. You know, I remember um, one of the first things that I, you know, I started looking into this right away and we didn't have jack.org at that point. We, uh, we actually started a memorial fund at Kids Help Phone. Um, and that's where we, we made a, a donation. Our family made a donation and other people started piling on. And pretty soon we had, uh, you know, a little bit of, of money and, and I started looking into things. And one thing that sticks out in my mind, just to your point, um, I kind of, uh, negotiated my way to be a speaker at the uh, at a conference that was happening in Halifax and it was the Canadian Association of Suicide Prevention annual conference okay. and for some reason I thought I'm gonna meet a lot of people here I need to tell this story I need to find out more about this mental health space and I remember sitting on a plane going to Halifax from Toronto and the person next to me says oh you know why are you going to Halifax and it's so hard to, it's so easy, I guess, to avoid the real reason. Oh, I'm, you know, cause I actually happened to be from Halifax. I could have told them anything, but um, I was committed really from very early on to not avoid those topics. So if it was after a squash game and one of my best friends helped me so much by getting me out, you know, and being active after we lost Jack, you have to go on. Remember Sandra, one of her big therapies per se was, was uh, one of her best friends and then a number of her best friends would just come over every day and take her and they'd go for a long walk and they'd talk and they'd talk about uh, this issue, but they'd also just just talk. Um, but anyway, I'm on this plane and the, pe the person next to me asked that. And, um, you know, from that conversation and every other conversation, when I've told people what happened to us, not one person that I can ever remember judged and maybe it's the way I've learned how to tell that story. Um, but they, they haven't, I don't think, thought less of me. They, uh, I think they've been engaged by it. And quite often, surprisingly, you get a story back. Um, it's pretty amazing uh, how that all works. So, uh, yeah, I've sort of learned how to be comfortable telling that story. But also, people are much more used to hearing those stories. Um, you know, in some areas, you know, and I sort of travel in a circle where people are, uh, the stigma is reduced a lot. People are starting to have these conversations, but there's still so much work to do. Yeah, you can definitely see how opening up first is giving people the permission to, yeah. to share what's on their mind, tragedies they've been through, and you can really have a human connection in that yeah. way. Absolutely. I want to I wanna ask you about resilience yeah. from you and your family. I see you every time I see you as enthusiastic and high energy and extremely supportive, very charismatic. And when something like this happens in our lives where we experience trauma or we're suffering, how, what are your strategies for, for coping with that? How are you thinking about being resilient? Because from, from what I see from you, you bounced back very quickly and you started taking action very quickly. I'm not saying it wasn't easy because it was 
I'm sure devastating and continues to be. So can you tell us a little bit about being resilient and how you think about that and what are the, some of the strategies you used? Yeah, and it, it wasn't necessarily that uh, conscious, Jonathan, at the time. You know, I mentioned one already. Uh, it wasn't a strategy I had, but the effect of my friend getting me out and whether it be playing tennis or squash or going for a bike ride or entering me into a, you know, um, outdoor triathlon or whatever we did the, that following summer, um, he, he, it, part of it is sort of just being kept busy and getting back to a routine. But what you have to realize, these sorts of things affect everybody differently. And I'm not trying to say that everybody should be like me uh, and have, you know, left their job and started doing this uh, full time, like literally within weeks. That's, I think, probably pretty unusual. But one thing I would say that if tragedy does strike and and you um, you somehow figure out a way that because we, we honestly felt and I don't mean to be too heavy about this, but at at uh, Jack's funeral, we said, um, you know, we can't let this be. There was a young man who played played Let It Be, uh, uh, the Beatles song, um, at, the, at the funeral. And uh, it sort of fit with uh, our, our, our words, which were, we, we have to let it be for Jack. It's too late, but for others, we can't let it be. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, um, in terms of my strategies and my resilience, maybe I'm just a little bit uh, built that way, uh, you know, go forward. But I think if you can find some way to, to give back, to get involved. And we, do, we see that with so many families uh, and organizations and groups that, that help Jack.org. Some of them surface four or five years after they've lost somebody. Uh, but when then they come out and get together and bring their friends together uh, in memory, let's say, of who they may have lost or who might have struggled, uh, you see how it starts immediately helping them. And, and I actually see this in our network. You know, there's there's almost 3,000 people like you, Jonathan, uh, young people actively volunteering uh, for Jack.org, delivering our programmatic messages. And um, we don't talk about it a lot, but um, there is evidence around the fact, and maybe a little bit of your, your, uh, uh, your preamble at the start speaks to that, um, there's evidence that it helps them. They're out there doing work to help their peers, but in doing so, it helps them and uh, it builds their resilience. So yeah, I think I'm a stronger person now uh, uh, probably than I was then. I'm, I'm sort of even conscious about this stuff. That was when you're just going through life and you think everything's fine, you're not, you know, you're not thinking about uh, uh, some unexpected thing happening. Uh, and, uh, but I've talked to so many families now and, and tried to, uh, you know, share, you know, what we've gone through and, and how it's helped. But it was really critical that our friends were behind us and that the family was behind what I wanted to do. And they all contribute in their own way. Sandra sits on our board and has been a massive contributor. Uh, ben and Julia come out to events and fundraise and have their friends involved. They bring big teams to our ride, stuff like that. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty special when you get, you know, uh, people, people want to help you help others. Yeah, I made a mental note about something you said there about the preamble that I made. And I think based off the friendships that I've made inside of Jack.org, they would all attest and agree to what I'm about to say, which is when you give youth an opportunity to make a difference, you give them an opportunity to lead, to make an impact, to make change, there's, there's real fulfillment inside of contribution. Right. And the contribution that I make for Jack.org and to, to students when we do, we do talks, it really makes me feel alive and it really makes me feel like I'm making a difference. And yeah. so again, that's why, that's why I really appreciate the opportunity you folks give us. And so I want to continue to actually, what I was thinking about then was you mentioned not letting it be for other youth. Yeah. And I remember listening to a Ted talk that you gave sure. at Queens university about not being a pioneer in this space, but being a foot soldier in the space. And I really resonated with that. I'm like, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm a foot soldier on the ground making a difference. And so how do you think about being a foot soldier and what, what could that mean for, it doesn't have to be people that are listening right now that want to make an impact with mental health. Maybe there's a different cause that they want to make an impact on, but what does that mean for them and how can we start to, to use that philosophy? 
Well, I'll give you, a, a, I really appreciate you listening to that TED talk. It was, like you said, I think back in 2012. Yeah. And uh, just to refresh the listeners, it was uh, 2010 that we lost Jack. So it was early days. Jack.org had not even been incorporated. We were still in our, uh, we spent two years with Kids Help Phone. We sort of refined the model a little bit, did a pilot program with 36 schools. Uh, and then we actually shifted the program with Kids Help Phone's full blessing to Queen's University for a year uh, because we wanted to truly test this youth engagement model, which is what Jack.org is all about. And, uh, uh, you know, at that time, I definitely felt, you know, there were others before me, you know, uh, uh, we, there's a famous Canadian named Michael Wilson who recently passed and he was, I think it was back in 1995, he came out and started talking about the fact that he had lost his son. And there's others uh, like Michael, those were the really early pioneers. And I think what I said in, in that TED talk was, I may be, a, a, I'm definitely a foot soldier, maybe a little ahead of the pack. And I think I probably was. Um, uh, I still feel like maybe leading the wave a little bit, but it's really going to take us all. Um, you know, if I didn't have the people around me, the young people who become engaged with this, you know, uh, we didn't even have a staff at that time. And now uh, I think we hired our 41st staff person um, just a couple days ago, and we've got six or seven more hires planned for this year. Uh, on top of that, there's eight students in this summer. I mean, it's a hopping place of people who want to help. And what they're doing is supporting uh, the real advocacy work that almost 3,000 young leaders are doing at all these chapters delivering, I think it was 445 talks you guys delivered last year. And you did a nice handful of those, Jonathan, but uh, it's about 123 speakers that delivered those talks in every province and territory. And it's so authentic when it comes from a young person who's been through something or is living with their own struggles and they're on stage talking about it to an audience, typically an audience of you know, uh, high school students, for example, uh, can be any young people anywhere, but uh, typically it's an audience of uh, high school uh, students who are seeing you just a couple years older, maybe four or five years older, uh, having gone through what you've gone through, uh, it really resonates with those people and it gets them willing to step up, um, ask for help if they need it, and really importantly, be there for somebody uh, uh, that they think might be struggling in their life. And, uh, you know, if I knew now what I knew, uh, if I knew then what I knew now, would I have been able to pick up some signs and symptoms? Maybe, um, but would I have known enough to ask different questions uh, of Jack, just as anybody in my life that I ask questions of? Those are some of the, uh, the learnings. And, uh, but it all goes back to that question you had, that, it builds, if you like, some confidence and resilience in you to, to have these kind of conversations. I'm sure your first talk is much different than how you now deliver, uh, having done talks, tours in New Brunswick and all the stuff that you've done. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about that youth empowerment model you talked about. Yeah. There is almost this virality effect that I see inside Jack.org that doesn't exist inside of a lot of other charities where you have important causes and they've got great leaders behind them, but they're not growing and innovating as fast as you folks are. And so what's the difference there? Why is that so important? And then how can we all think about whether it's building community or using this, this empowerment model to, to grow our organizations or our ideas? I, First of all, I don't really take any credit. Uh, I guess I'm at the center of this thing, but there's a couple things, and we spoke about it off air uh, before the podcast, a couple things in my background that I think probably are a little different than, than most, most charities. I was an entrepreneur all my life. So, you know, from having a paper route at grade from uh, in when I was 11 years old to, you know, setting up a little paint contracting business in the summers through university and, and then into real business, that's what I did. So I was very comfortable with the idea of, of having an idea and then trying to, to grow it. Uh, and this one, um, there was really an untapped, um, not much supply being out there, but a huge demand and a need for, for what we wanted to uh, provide. The, the, uh, the real trick, I think, was we have sort of bundled it all up with what I would say is 
uh, arguably outstanding uh, communications. Uh, everything from our websites to, to how we communicate with our donors, how we write a, a grant proposal. Um, it's seen, and uh, it's the people around me that have done that. What, what, uh, oh, by the way, our internet, internet connection is unstable. Hopefully it's okay. Um, yeah, it should be okay now. Okay, great. Um, it's, it's really the people around me. So what I did is sort of bring that entrepreneurial spirit and that sort of business acumen, you could call it, and set very high standards. So when we built our whole new website a little over a year ago, it probably was uh, launched a year ago, but it was six or eight months in the making, you know, setting the standard that this is going to be the best website uh, in the space, uh, in the charitable space, and arguably trying to be the best website period. I mean, you know, that's a lofty goal, uh, but that aspirational nature um, uh, is, is something you set as, as sort of a leader, uh, and then the team rallies behind that. And uh, we have this advantage. Uh, it's almost an unfair advantage for some reason. It pays back dividends because, you know, we put an application, uh, a, a posting for a, a job application, and we get 100 resumes from outstanding uh, young candidates. And uh, uh, so it all sort of builds on itself, right? But it starts with that sort of, um, you know, high standards, that entrepreneurial spirit, um, really applying business principles of, of uh, metrics and evaluation, uh, best practices, good governance at the board level, um, but bringing the people in around who are going to do it. Um, it's another unfair advantage that we work with youth and you know, you guys are all smarter than us old fossils. Uh, you bring more energy, you're more savvy, you're more creative, you're at that part of your life. And uh, that's where the good ideas come out of. It's, it's incredible. So, uh, um, you know, it's, we've sort of broken through that small charity space. There is, I think, almost 90,000 charities in Canada. And the vast bulk of them, like over 80,000 of them, are, are very, very small. With, you know, they're maybe with a, uh, some volunteer staff and one or two staff, things like that. And uh, we've managed to break through that. The, the key challenge will be, as we continue to grow and scale, um, how do we keep that energy? How do we keep that uh, vitality and keep being super appealing to our, our demographics? And I say demographics, we're serving a youth demographic, but we also need to be appealing to those people supporting us. The donors. The, the, we survive uh, uh, through the kindness of, of donors who, uh, you know, we, we, we look for them, but lots of them find us. It's incredible. Uh, <laughs> If you don't mind touching a little bit more on leadership yeah. through your role, I think we talked a little bit about having high standards. I'm part of a men's group that I lead every Thursday nights. And we talk a lot about having high standards as a team. We talk a lot about being the team and holding that as our context. So that, and, and for the sake of this conversation, our leadership team knows that based off where we hold our context, the team's always gonna fall a little bit shorter than that. So we need to hold ourselves to the highest standards first and then let them try to bring themselves up to that versus if we have low standards and they're always going to fall short of that as well. So how do you think about um, leadership? Because uh, I, I, I could tell that you're, you're definitely a visionary. And so can you tell me a little bit more about your philosophy, philosophy there? Well, I don't know. It's a, I haven't been to a whole pile of leadership courses and stuff like that, to be totally honest. Um, but there is a lot of things in my life that I was fortunate enough to be put in situations where I was able to practice some leadership skills. Uh, you know, learning how to do public speaking, for example, is a is a massive skill. You've you've become outstanding at it at, at a very young age. So I had those opportunities early on in life. Um, but I think. Best, uh, I've often said in, in, in the charitable space generally, but certainly in the, in the mental health space, there's a bit of what I call a leadership void. There is, the space is filled with amazingly smart, dedicated um, people who are doing, uh, you know, especially at the service, the front lines, the service level, doing incredibly uh, tough and meaningful and important work. 
Um, but I would say there hasn't been enough uh, uh, leadership and, and potentially even the convening of leadership to make sure that the overall sector, whatever sector you're in, in our case, youth mental health, uh, is, is as efficient, is efficient um, uh, and effective as it can be. Um, you know, we all know the challenges um, uh, of wait lists and wait times and finding, uh, you know, whether it's a psychologist or a psychiatrist that you can see and relate to and, and uh, you know, even getting an appointment can be a huge, massive issue. Um, that's an indication that we've got uh, a sector that hasn't been able to convince um, government yet uh, to properly fund it, uh, hasn't been able to convince uh, those in power to um, get all on the same page about exactly what's needed and how we're going to deliver services the most effectively. Those are some of the things that I dream of that, uh, that are in the future that you know, aren't the exact mission of Jack.org. You know, we're delivering our programs as our main focus but part of me, and maybe that's a little bit of a leadership gene, is starting to think, well, what comes next? Mm -hmm. uh, we, just, uh, we just finished our uh, first um, uh, strategic plan cycle. So we wrote our first strategic plan, formal strategic plan in 2015, and it was meant to run through 2020. But fortunately, we hit the 2020 targets a year early. So awesome. we've, start, we've started the next cycle, and uh, we've started to dream really big. And... Uh, uh, having that sort of boldness and confidence to to think really big, but still manage risk, and you know we have to be real. You have to have the the donors there to support you before you can, uh, you know, you can uh, be too ambitious. Uh, but we're really uh, thinking of ways that we can contribute beyond the main core work uh, to the sector at large, uh, because we have a a particular niche in the sector now that there could be ways that that leadership and all these young leaders who are young advocates in all their communities, if we can tie that all together, there could be ways that we can really have an impact that's bigger than just, you know, the talks and chapters and summit work that, uh, that goes on, for example. Yeah, I do want to talk about what the future will look like for the mental health landscape. I'd love to take a step back first and talk about right now and even maybe even a little bit in the past. What I've found is that the stigma seem to have been one of the biggest barriers for youth and for, for adults to reach out for help. Do you find that's still the case or do you find that there's a, there's another barrier today that's preventing people from reaching out? Uh, it depends where you are. So there's certain communities, certain schools, uh, and you know, you could even have a community that it has two schools and one is m much more far along the uh, paradigm or the, uh, you know, learning curve uh, than the others, but it really depends where you are. So we see, places where we've had chapters in place for a period of years. Um, they're still doing their, their education and uh, stigma reduction work, but they're, they're wanting to do more. They're moving into advocacy work and, and trying to figure out, okay, what's really going on in this campus in the way of service delivery? And uh, we're trying to support our young leaders to figure that out as a network and what's going on at all these campuses around the country and then giving them the tools to learn how to be effective advocates for how to change that. You know, why is there a, a certain service, let's call it a peer support service at one university, and you know, 20 miles down the road, 20 kilometers down the road, they don't have it at that university. It's a service that can really be, uh, if it's done correctly and best practices, be a huge addition to the overall basket of services on a campus. So, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of listening to the young people and then try to support them with the resources. Uh, but we're still going, as you can imagine, you've done it, to communities uh, every day where uh, a talk, a Jack talk, would be the very first sort of peer-led talk about mental health they've ever had at their school. And in schools like that, you're still working with the basics. Um, so it's sort of a two-part answer. You gotta keep doing the basic work uh, you know, like if you think about it on athletics, you got to keep doing your core training, but maybe you got to you got to uh, get the advanced stuff going um, uh, as well uh, for for those competitive moments. Yeah, you can really never stop working on the fundamentals. Yeah, exactly. And you improve those all the time, right? Every summer we go through, we take the evaluation, for example, from the 
445 Jack Talks that happened this past year. And the team uh, cranks through that, they think through, they get the feedback from all those surveys that were done, and they create the new talk, train all the speakers on the new talk that's coming up, and those subtle enhancements, and that, that rapid, uh, you know, uh, sort of- Iteration. Iteration, that's the word I was looking for, is, is so helpful. Uh, and uh, to be nimble doing that is, is, is hugely uh, important. Yeah, I'm a big believer that one of the biggest fundamentals is that first step of asking for help. Yep. And we, we talked a little bit about stigma and how that could be a barrier. What would you say to the people, you know, as we're rounding out to the end here, what would you say to the people that they feel like things have changed in their life, they're in a position where maybe they're struggling with their mental health, but they, they haven't taken that first step? You know, what do you, how do you encourage people to, to do that and ask for help and reach out? Well, I'm going to try to answer that in two ways and hopefully we have time. The, it's, it's so important to talk to anybody you're comfortable with talking about. You know, we, we talk about the most young people will reach out to a peer first and your, your best friends are not going to judge you. They're going to support you. And so I would just try to give people the confidence to know that those closest to you uh, are not going to judge, uh, you know, you want to find the right time. You want to, you know, not maybe not bring it up while you're with a whole bunch of people. You want to find a quiet spot when the person has time, but, you know, be prepared to kind of uh, pour your heart out. And that brings me to the second part of it, because what we're finding from the network more and more is that as more and more people are asking for help, the people actually on the receiving end don't know what to do. Uh, and this, I think, is a, is a huge thing that the team, with the support of the network, has been working on. And actually, you know well about the launch of a new resource we put out uh, in May that we were working on for almost a year. But where it, where it came from was exactly that. You know, all these chapter initiatives, all these talks were going on, and people started asking for more help. And, and so our young leaders started saying, give us more information to support them while they're waiting for, in some cases, professional care or to meet with a guidance counselor. Or maybe it's a crisis situation, they need to be taken to an emergency room. I mean, there's all level, right? And so this uh, has resulted into, uh, you know, the, the product called Be There, which is found at bethere.org, which is the second major website that, that jack.org has. And it's really designed to give you kind of the, what we call the five golden rules for how to support somebody who is struggling. And the more you can be responsive to someone who's reaching out for help and have a clue about what to say, and a lot of it is just being there for them, but there are some specific things that you can learn from that resource that will make that kind of magic happen. So that when someone reaches out, uh, you know, the person isn't just overwhelmed, uh, and not knowing how to help. But for those reaching out, um, you know, whether it's a trusted adult, maybe it's your parents, maybe not, maybe it's a sister or brother, uh, most likely it's, it's a peer you're going to be most comfortable reaching out to first. Um, I, I can't think of any examples where people regret, uh, you know, having those conversations. It's kind of like me having those, that conversation I alluded to on the plane when someone says, where are you going? And I say, well, I'm going to a suicide prevention conference. Oh, that's interesting. Why? Uh, well, I lost my son. You know, it's a tough thing to get out, but once you've done it once, it becomes that much more easier. And, uh, and uh, it's so valuable. This is the biggest health related issue uh, for young people globally. This is, you know, suicide remains the leading health related cause of death for young people. If we don't care enough to learn about how to support one another, you know, you know, where where are we? And we've got to care about that. Yeah, I think from my understanding of the demographic and psychographic of the people that actually listen to the show, they do care and they are trying to make a difference. And whether it's mental health or another cause that's important to them, for those that are listening today and they heard your story and they they do want to try to be there for other people in their lives, maybe they need to reach out for help, where would you suggest that they go for some additional resources, whether it's to learn more about how big of an epidemic, mental health, uh, and uh, 
suicide is across Canada and the world, or if it's about, like you said, on the other end of that, how to be there for people who are reaching out for help, where's the best place for them to go for that? Well, in terms of supporting a peer, we are very proud of the Be There resources. So, so I would definitely encourage people to go there. Um, we did a huge landscape scan and we found one nice thing about it is all the information that's in Be There, we didn't create it. What we did was packaged it up and did our best to make it engaging yeah. and voiced it through young people like you sharing their stories and uh, very thoughtfully put it together with video clips and so on. Um, uh, all the stuff was out there. It was stuff that we found on, you know, very professional sites like the Mental Health Commission site or CMHA or Kids Help Phone or uh, CAMH or, you know, you name it, uh, or global resources. But, you know, you can find the things you're talking about in terms of what the, epi you know, the, the size of the problem is on most sites. You can find it on uh, Mental Health Commission. You can find it on CAMH. You can find it some of it on our site. Uh, we have tons of other resources that are helpful for people, um, some of which actually came, uh, um, you know, via other organizations and you reposition some of that information. Some of our core resources um, are positioned are from teenmentalhealth.org. They've got great information. So they've allowed us to uh, position that on our site so people can find out about, you know, substance abuse or uh, self-harm or uh, you know what is depression all those sorts of things so there's it's a google away to find out this stuff but i would stick to reliable uh, sources and uh, um, you know kind of reputable names uh, we'd like to include ourselves in, in in that sort of uh, on that list for sure and uh, it's out there you just go look and find okay well, i'd say for those people that are interested in learning more uh, definitely go to be there. And I'd also encourage you to get involved in any capacity that you can with Jacked or being a volunteer and a speaker and part of your programming has made a really positive impact on my life and my, my mental health and my family's lives. So I really appreciate that. And I'd encourage people to get involved and do their part to try to make a difference for this initiative. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about really quickly is just give you the floor. That's how I like to end this podcast is about whatever you want to share from your heart. I'm very conscious that I control the flow and the direction of the conversation. So whatever's on your mind, what's ever on your heart, if it's a book, a quote, and then you want to share, the floor is yours. Yeah, this is the one I, I did give a little bit of thought to because you, uh, you know, for those listening, you were kind enough to give me a heads up about this. And uh, this is not earth shattering in some ways, but I still think that the vast majority of people I don't uh, get in contact with, um, they, they don't put their mental health on the same uh, sort of footing as, as their physical health. Um, but having said that, they also don't take enough care of their physical health. And the same things, in, in, as far as I'm concerned, the same things apply. And you know, to really dumb it down, if you take care of, of your, uh, what you put in your body, what you eat, what you drink, you know, and I'm not saying don't have a beer. I'm not, you know, uh, but I'm saying if you can put healthy food in your body, just like for your physical uh, well-being, it helps your mental well-being in a huge way. It keeps that brain functioning and healthy. Um, the, the second big one for me, and I've alluded to it a couple of times, is, is exercise. You know, I've been fairly active all through my life. When the kids were young, you get a little less active and, you know, you get a little bigger around the middle and and you just, when you get fit or fitter, and I don't mean you all have to, you know, be pumping iron and doing all that stuff. It could be just a, a daily walk or biking to work now and then. It could be whatever it is. But that exercise piece is huge. And sometimes, just to digress a little bit, I worry about uh, how, how that might have affected Jack. He was a rower at university. Uh, and if you know anything about rowing, you know how physically taxing it is. And but he was my size. He's sort of six feet tall, uh, pretty slender guy. And uh, so he wasn't going to be on the Queens rowing team by any stretch. And uh, uh, I often wonder how much that might have changed his brain chemistry going from huge amount of exercise to basically not much. Um, so exercise, you know, food being the first big one, exercise being a huge one. Uh, it has so many benefits for your physical and mental well-being. And then sleep. 
And sleep has been, I mean, um, in the last few years, I've been on a mission to try to improve my sleep. And I've been doing, I've been deep diving, reading books and listening to podcasts, trying to understand how to improve my own sleep. Because obviously it was impacted when we lost Jack and it was impacted for years. And then as we got Jack.org going, my racing mind would never stop because there's always another opportunity. And so it's been a big challenge. Uh, but I'm starting to get on top of it. And uh, uh, it's so restorative for your physical and mental health to get that good sleep. Uh, and uh, the last thing that uh, maybe isn't talked about quite as much, but uh, um, meditation, I think, is huge. I think mindfulness, meditation, if you can find a bit of time every day to quiet your mind and uh, learn the basic techniques. You know, I'm not too good at it yet, but I'm I'm working away at it, trying to make it a daily practice, and I'm a very busy person. Um, uh, you will gain time. You won't lose time. You will sleep better. You will uh, feel better. Uh, you know. So those are some of the basics that I think apply to your life generally, and certainly apply uh, to your mental well-being. And they're so easy to do if you just try to be as conscious about them uh, whenever you can. And by the way, the eating one is also good for the planet. So, uh, you know, why not, right? Yeah, absolutely. I remember listening to a quote. It was like, if you don't have 10 minutes a day to meditate, then you should take an hour. <laughs> That's how important it is. Yeah. And I, I'm a big believer in the fundamentals. And I think if you're missing any of those four, then, you know, it's going to be it's going to be very challenging for you. I know the biggest challenge that I have is with sleep. I think with you, I can really resonate with that kind of entrepreneurial DNA of yeah. mind racing, thinking about ideas and avenues that I could take and action that I could pursue. And I, I tend to wake up super early. So I just yeah. need to make sure that I get to sleep early enough too. So I really appreciate that. That's good advice for everyone that's listening. And we'll continue to hammer home those fundamentals on this show. All right. All right. Okay. Well, Jonathan, it's been a pleasure. Thanks again so much for, for doing this podcast, but uh, for all the work you're doing. Uh, for mental health generally and jack.org and you are a young leader that uh, i am incredibly proud of so thank thanks you. eric appreciate it and you enjoy your squash okay okay take okay care. thanks so much we'll talk soon all right take care okay bye for now